Howdy there folks, I'm Quinn of Snazzy Labs and this video is actually a long time coming. For those of you that watch my videos, you probably know that in my 22 years of life, I've only owned two Windows computers. One was a home theater PC that I built about a year ago that hosts uh, our video content for our Plex server that my family uses. We almost never interface with it directly. And the second one is a Service Pro 3 that I used for a few months and really liked. But other than that, I've been grown as a Mac kid since birth. I've only ever owned Macs. I know Mac OS X backwards and forwards, and I'm not really that competent with Windows, but we're changing, at least here in the office. Now, why? All of the videos on Snazzy Labs that you see are edited with Adobe Premiere Pro. Now, I bought this $4,000 Mac Pro about two years ago that's still the exact same model for sale, $4,000, with depreciation, mine's only worth about 2,500 now. But that aside, I have a $2,500 computer that's allegedly super powerful that I can't even work with because we're starting to record stuff in ProRes 422. Ever since I got my uh, Sony a7R 2 we've been recording much higher quality content in terms of uh, maybe I hope you've noticed the quality, but in terms of file size, in terms of how processor and resource intensive those formats are. And Adobe Premiere Pro on the Mac simply cannot handle it. Um, there isn't CUDA graphics card acceleration for the AMD cards inside the Mac Pro from within Adobe Premiere CC. And even when you kind of hack around this to slightly enable them, it doesn't do a very good job. The computer stutters and it drops frames even when we're only asking 24 frames per second in 4K. And so we can't even really preview what a video is going to look like until it's exported. And that's frustrating because that's a $3,000, $4,000 computer that can't even do what we need it to do. So we want to sell it. Now, a lot of people say, Quinn, just switch to Final Cut Pro 10. And that is true. That is a very obvious solution. Final Cut Pro 10 does use extreme, uh, I mean, it's way more resource uh, efficient. It's designed by Apple and developed specifically for that hardware. So it would work really, really well. The problem is, is I don't like Final Cut Pro 10. I won't say for a second that it's not powerful because it is. It's an extremely powerful application. And, and many people that make far better videos than I use Final Cut Pro 10 without any issues. The problem is when it comes to a personal level, I've tried to use Final Cut Pro for the last several videos and I just have gotten so frustrated I go back to Premiere. I've spent money on tutorials and it's just not the app for me. Totally preference-based. If you like Final Cut Pro 10, that is awesome. And I know it's a good app. I just don't like it. So I want to stay with Adobe Premiere Pro. And so the obvious solution would be to sell this now $2,500 computer I have and spend $2,200 on a Windows PC that I can build from scratch that will be way better in essentially every department in terms of processing power, in terms of graphics, in terms of cooling, everything. The only thing that will be slightly worse is the size. But I'm doing this all in a mini ITX build. Now I'm gonna stop talking about this so I can talk to you while I'm actually building it. But I just wanna let you know that it's an exciting project. I'm excited to do it. It's not going to be the end of Mac videos on my channel. I still have my MacBooks. I still have my Macs at home. I, I will not be moving away from Mac OS. I'm just adding an additional Windows computer into my life so that we can do uh, our video editing here on Snazzy Labs a bit more efficiently. And I'm excited to embrace both operating systems. So I'm gonna stop rambling. Without further ado, let's get to the build. The case I chose was the Fractal Design Nano S. It's actually a really big case for a mini ITX build, but it's still way smaller than an ATX tower and gives me the advantages of water cooling. The motherboard I got is really cool, not just because it has dual gigabit ethernet and USB 3.1, but because it is the only mini ITX board on the market that supports the LGA 2011 socket. Now, why did I opt in for the 5820K, which is an older Intel i7 chip instead of the new Skylake processors? Well, the main reason is that this is a hexa-core processor and video editing benefits from more cores rather than higher clock speeds, unlike gaming. The board also supports four lane PCIe NVMe storage. So I can use the new Samsung 950 Pro 500 gigabyte SSD as a scratch disk at crazy fast speeds, which is important when I'm editing video. And then I'm actually going to still boot off of a standard SSD via SATA. Now, when I put the motherboard into the case, you can either see that the Fractal Nano S is slightly larger than your average mini ITX case, and or you can see that this board is just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, look how large that processor is on the board itself. Because of it though, there are some detriments and some downsides, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's so jam-packed that they had to put some connectors in some pretty silly places. 
There's also a mini PCIe slot, which is intended for the wireless internet Wi-Fi adapter that comes included with the motherboard. Now that's pretty neat because I can get wireless AC with the antennas directly on the back of the board. I plan on using this wired via ethernet, but the option being there is always nice. Now the power supply I decided to get was the Corsair AX760i. Uh, there was no particular reason I decided to get this other than the fact that it had good reviews and I was able to get a refurb from Newegg on eBay for just over $100. My biggest frustration during installation was this stupid 24 pin connector that had to go to the motherboard. Now it fit into the motherboard just fine, but the connector that was going into the power supply was a beast to get in. I mean, I pushed with all my might and it would not go in. I pulled the power supply out to push with all my might and it would not go in. I started Googling around to see if I had broken something or if the cable was in the wrong spot. Other people seem to have similar issues as me and someone recommended using two flathead screwdrivers to push it down with all of my strength into the connector. And I seem to kind of have gotten it to stick, but that may be something that comes with the refurb unit and I may have to look at that in the near future. The video card I opted in for is perhaps slightly over the top. It is the 980 Ti GTX Hybrid from EVGA. The reason I decided to get this card was A, because Premiere Pro really does benefit from hardware acceleration using the graphics card, but also because I do want to be able to play games on this computer. I've never been a PC gamer. I've never played PC games before, but I think it sounds interesting and I'm excited to give it a go. And so I decided to opt in for a graphics card that would not hold me back in any way. And the hybrid seems to do the trick. The cooler is where things got a little tricky. Now the board, it, because everything is so jam packed, there's no room to have a standard size socket. So it uses what's called a narrow ILM socket. And this is problematic because that is a server cooler socket, which means all of the uh, coolers on the market are extremely loud. And the one included with the PC is horrendously loud. Now, Asetek, which is the company that manufactures all the NZXT and Corsair coolers, makes a little adapter, that ring I'm putting on right now. That's available from their eBay page for five dollars and I had to find it on my own, but I eventually found it and decided that I could use any of Asetek's manufactured coolers and the Kraken X61 was cheap on eBay. So that's what I went with. And I think it should do a really, really great job at cooling the CPU, especially considering that it's much better than the extremely loud stock fan for this very odd build. And that pretty much concludes it. I put the RAM in, booted the SSD and everything went perfectly, right? No, dead wrong. You're probably wondering, you finished the build, so why is it in pieces on your desk? And that's, that's a good question. I've had an extremely frustrating last 24 hours. I finished the build, as you guys saw on the video, and I tried to boot the computer and I couldn't get the system to post. It would not boot. So I pulled pretty much everything apart until Static Austin, one of my wonderful uh, Twitter followers, pointed out to me that derp de derp, I had installed ECC-based DDR4 RAM. ECC RAM is not supported by the 5820K. The board supports it, but the CPU does not. Duh, I, I knew that. So what I had to do is I went home and grabbed some extra DDR4 RAM that I had that was non-ECC RAM. I was able to boot the machine just fine. However, once I started installing Windows and I tried to install Windows about two or three times, each time halfway through the installation, the computer would automatically turn off and it would start a boot loop, like it would, it wouldn't post, right? This, the fans would spin for about a second and then the power supply would cycle and it'd do that infinitely. I couldn't even get into the into the BIOS screen. The system, the hardware would not boast. Uh, so what I did was I pulled the uh, RAM out, I reinstalled the cooler, I reinstalled the graphics card, made sure that everything was aligned, I checked all the power supply connections, everything looked good, I'd boot it up and it would work and then it would shut down again and so I thought, this is really, really odd. And I took to Periscope and my wonderful Twitter followers once again pointed out that if the machine was running for a while, but then would turn off, it was probably a CPU thermal issue. And that was a good point. I checked on the NZXT cooler, which I had installed, and I did find it to be suspiciously quiet, especially considering that the graphics card was the same pump from the same manufacturer, and it was less quiet than the Kraken cooler. So we figured out that oopsie daisies, it looked like the pump wasn't working. That would explain it. The CPU was overheating to protect itself. It was shutting the computer off halfway through Windows installation. So what I did is I installed the stock cooler that came with the motherboard onto the processor and things were much better. I was able to successfully install Windows. I was able to boot into Windows um, and it was not really a problem at all. I spent 
uh, probably six to eight hours of the machine on while I was sleeping. Uh, it was installing Steam and several games. It was installing the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite. I came back to work this morning, rebooted the computer, all of the drivers installed correctly, all of the software was perfectly installed. And I rebooted the computer, it rebooted fine, and I was able to use the computer for about half an hour before it shut off again. It shut off and everything stopped working just like it had earlier that day. The odd thing was the CPU wasn't hot at all because the heatsink was properly attached and it was doing really, really great. I pulled everything apart, reassembled it to make sure that there were no loose connections and I was able to successfully boot into Windows once again. So now I'm getting frustrated because everything seems to work once I put it back together, but it doesn't work permanently. So what I decided to do is I thought maybe it's a CPU issue and I tried to stress test the CPU with CPU-Z. I watched the temperatures of the CPU and even though I was stress testing it, this cooler was freaking loud by the way, but it was good enough that the, the, the core temperature, the the CPU temperature would not surpass 57 degrees Celsius, which is not hot. Uh, so it wasn't an overheating issue on the CPU side. It had to be something else. And so I took to Periscope once again, and my Twitter followers and I have kind of decided that the problem is likely the power supply. It's the only thing would, that would explain the fact that the machine works for a while and then it stops working and it just reboots constantly until I seem to unplug everything, let it chill for a while, check all the connections, replug everything and then start it up again until it has another problem half an hour later. Um, that's what I'm suspecting. This is a Corsair uh, power supply that was a refurb. I got it on eBay for $100. Uh, it's about a $180 power supply. So I thought I got a really good deal on it and it was shipped by Newegg. So it was from an authorized reseller. However, the 24 pin connector that goes to the motherboard had a bit of an issue. It was really, 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 really hard to insert. I mean, really hard. I had to use two screwdrivers to push both sides of the connector into the power supply. And even though that that's kind of in there, it's not completely 100% seated like all of the rest of the cables. So I'm guessing that that is probably the issue. I went out to go buy another power supply here in town, but pretty much all of them suck. I don't want to spend 90 to $100 on a power supply that's junk. And so I think what I'm going to do is, is file an RMA for this. And then I actually reached out to ASRock and they thought that it might be the motherboard as well. And they offered to do uh, an RMA as well. So I'm just going to kind of eliminate all of the denominators and get rid of any possible issue that it could be. I'm guessing it's the power supply, but I'm going to ship the power supply and the motherboard out to get swapped out with new ones. And if the problem still persists, then it can really be only one thing and that would be the CPU itself, but that doesn't seem very likely. So that's it, a very extremely frustrating build. It's halfway disassembled because I've been plugging and pulling stuff all day. And since I'm sending the, the power supply back, I'm gonna have to send all of the cables back. I'm going to have to do a complete disassembly of this computer, which I just built. Oh, I guess I slightly feel a sense of sigh of relief now because I know it at least one of three components <laughs> that it might be, but it's, it's really, really, really troublesome and it's been frustrating. And the frustrating part is, is if I turn the CPU on right now, the power supply and try to boot the computer, it'll boot fine because it's been sitting for a while, a couple hours. But I guarantee you that after 10 or 15 minutes, the thing would shut off and only spin the fans for about a second before it cycled the power once again. And that sounds like a PSU issue. So that's this frustrating build that I could not complete. Welcome to the wonderful world of building computers. <laughs> now, there are a lot of people that are saying, oh, you should have stayed with Mac. That doesn't happen to Macs. Macs have problems too. I've had uh, two defective Macs before right out of the box. I'm just really, really, really unlucky. But hopefully by the end of next week, I can get this build finally completed. And then we can do some benchmarks between this rig and the Mac Pro behind me and let you guys see what a good deal once it's all built and hopefully stable that a $2,000 uh, computer can have in comparison to a $4,000 Mac Pro. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share my frustration with me. Ugh! And as always, stay snazzy. See you later, folks.